Hey, good day, it's Presto here. Uh, thanks for joining me. I'm doing another episode today of Metal Finishing with Mark, and this one is called Anodizing 101. Now, why would you want to anodize materials in the home shop? Well, it's a decorative process in my view, that's why I do it, but there are some other advantages to anodizing. It improves the surface corrosion resistance of metals like aluminium, magnesium and titanium. It also improves the durability of the part. It makes the surface tougher and more abrasion resistant. But the big advantage is that you can uh, dye the part once you've anodized it because the surface becomes porous and the dye can penetrate into that porous layer and later you can seal the pores over using hot water or boiling water. So that makes the colour more fade resistant and locks the colour into the surface of the metal. Now these are some parts that I've done at home here. This is a dial indicator holder for the metal lathe. This is the tracking adjustment mechanism for my metal cutting bandsaw. This is one of those multi-axis vice stops. All of those were done at home. Uh, these are probably the more recent parts that I've done. I have done lots and lots of parts using this process. Some of them were absolute failures and it's fair to say that I've learned a lot as I've gone along. But now I think I'm making more consistent parts and I'm getting more consistent results with this method. These are some parts that I'm going to do today. This is a handle for a jeweler's roll. This is the locking knob for a mitre fence that goes on the bandsaw that this came from. And these are two little circular discs that are going to get turned into maker plates also for the bandsaw. So that's where we're going with this now. I should add that I'm not going to go into the science of how anodizing works. It's far more complex than I've got time to show you here. I will point you to a video that is very, very good if you want to really get into the nitty gritty of how it works. But what I want to show today is just simply what I do in the home shop and the techniques that I use. And you can judge for yourself whether it's something that you might be able to work with in your shop. So let's have a look first of all at some of the materials and equipment that you'll need. This is probably the single most expensive piece of kit you'll need to buy if you're going to do anodizing at home. This is a DC power supply. The brand name is Gophert, G-O-P-H-E-R-T, and I'll put the model number on the screen below. I bought this on eBay. It wasn't terribly expensive. I, you know, from memory, I think it was about $50, $60, but I'll check that. This one will do up to 32 volts DC and up to 5 amps. It's small, compact, lightweight. It's got a little encoder here which allows you to set the voltage and the average and that's selectable by this slide switch so it'll do constant current or constant voltage. Now if you do any research on anodizing at home you'll see that a lot of people recommend using battery chargers or just a 12 volt DC battery and although that works you don't get a lot of control. So certainly with a car battery you've got no control over the current uh, or the voltage for that matter. This one uh, allows you to select both of those and I generally operate it around about 15 volts. The other thing is that it's just a handy bench power supply. It's, uh, it's accurate and controllable, so if you're doing testing or you just want to run a prototype circuit, this is great. Okay, the next thing you'll need is uh, cathodes. Now, cathodes used in anodizing can be made of either aluminium or lead. Now, when I first got started with this, I was using aluminium. So these are just a couple of strips. Problem with them though is that they will gradually get consumed by the electrolyte in your anodizing bath. And you can see these used to be pristine, they were shiny and smooth. Now they're covered in craters and pits and so on. And at one point I was just leaving the cathodes in the tank and it might be six months before I come back and use it. And I found that one set of cathodes had been completely dissolved nothing left of them and all of that aluminium that was dissolved by the electrolyte ends up in the electrolyte and that can upset the balance of the electrolyte. So I ditched these and now I'm using these lead cathodes here. The advantage with these is that they've got hooks that hang over the side of the tank so you can just simply slip them down into the electrolyte. When you've finished anodizing for the day just lift them out again and wash them clean, store them away. Uh, lead also doesn't get consumed by the electrolyte, so if you really wanted to leave them in the tank indefinitely you could. Now I cast these using a little mould that I made out of aluminium. You can buy lead sheet down at the hardware store, but it's expensive. The thickness only needs to be around about one or two millimetres thick at the most. These are a little bit heavier, about three millimetres. Now I've soldered a copper wire to the top of each one of those cathodes there. 
and I've just got a piece of earth wire joining them together and one goes on each side of the tank. So there's our cathodes. Let's have a look at the next piece of gear. You will need some sort of bus bar to connect your power supply to the individual parts that you're anodizing. Now a bus bar can be made of copper, this is aluminium which works fine and you need some way of connecting the bus bar to your part. Now I'm using 3mm aluminium wire. This is actually electrical transmission wire used for um, taking the power past your house. I just unraveled a section of that and I got this aluminium wire out of there. The downside with aluminium wire is that it actually gets anodized along with the part. And there's a curious thing about an anodized surface on aluminium, that is that it becomes non-conductive. And I'll show you that in a minute. But it does mean that each time you've used one of these hooks, you need to clean off the anodized coating or strip the anodized coating before you use it again. Otherwise, it will simply insulate the part from the bus bar. Now, another thing I learned just recently was that you need to be able to clamp this uh, hanger wire to your bus bar. Now, in the past, what I was doing was just simply hanging the wire from the bus bar with a hook. So I would just simply do that, hang that on there, and then I'd hang the part in the electrolyte. The downside with that is that a lot of the parts you do are quite small, it doesn't put a lot of weight on that hook and sometimes you'll find that you don't get a good electrical connection between the hook and your bus bar. And unless this is meticulously clean and the same with your wire hook, you can hang that part on there, put it in the tank, come back two hours later and find out that it hasn't anodized at all. So what I do now is I've drilled this bus bar with I think they're four millimeter diameter holes and I put the wire into one of those holes and then actually clamp it. So, uh, come on. So I'll tighten that screw down with the screwdriver and actually get the screw to bite into the aluminium. And then you can be sure that you've got a you know, continuous current going to your part. But just hanging it is a bit hit and miss. <laughs> For a long time, I couldn't figure out why I'd hang five parts on this bus bar and four of them would anodize and one wouldn't. And it was simply because it wasn't getting a good electrical connection. And it's, it's hard to tell at the time when you're doing the anodizing process which parts are working and which ones aren't because the current displayed on your power supply shows the total current for all the parts. And unless you lift each one individually and check the current meter, you won't really know. But this I find now gives me way more consistent results. Now you will remember I said that an anodized coating on aluminium will actually produce an insulating surface on that material. And this is a piece of pre-anodized aluminium sheet. And the back side of this has still got the anodized coating on it. And I can demonstrate here with my meter, I've got that set as a continuity tester. If I short out the leads, you can see that we get uh, zero resistance. But if I place it on the back side of this pre-anodized sheet, we get nothing. All right, absolutely nothing. Oop, there we go. Did we? No, nothing. If I turn it over, this side has been polished to remove that anodized coating, and you can see straight away we get back to zero resistance. This part here, once again, already anodized. If I check that, we get nothing. Now you can scratch through the coating, and it get the points of the probes through to the underlying layer of aluminium. See, yeah, well, there we go. So that's just sort of pressing really hard to get through that layer. But under normal circumstances, uh, the anodized coating is basically an insulator. So you need to be a little bit careful if you think about using this as a process for electrical parts, for example. This part to me was the biggest barrier in getting involved in anodizing at home. Any of the how-to guides that you read will tell you that the correct electrolyte to use for anodizing is sulfuric acid. Now, the only problem is that at one point, sulfuric acid was very easy to obtain. I used to buy it back in the 1980s for cleaning copper when I was making copper boilers with steam engines. And you could just go down to your local auto accessory shop and buy a four litre container. It's what they used to use for topping up lead acid batteries. Now, when I tried this about Four years ago, I walked in, tried the same spiel, and the very first thing they said is, what do you want it for? <laughs> I 
I ended up having to pay a fee to get it transported from a central warehouse. I had to fill out a declaration to say what I wanted it for. And I was treated with uh, suspicion the whole time I was in the shop. And I guarantee if you start looking around for this stuff online or if you make inquiries over the phone, you'll end up on a terror watch list somewhere. Sad but true, but they're the times we live in. But what I found out is that this stuff is an alternative. Now this is sodium bisulfate and it says on the label here it's for lowering pH in swimming pools. This is a three kilo tub. I bought it down in my local pool supply company and it's cheap. It's uh, way cheaper than sulfuric acid. Can't remember the exact price but um, I was quite surprised that it was as cheap as it was. Now my anodizing tank is 16 litres. The correct ratio for the sodium bisulfate is 20%. So I ended up using 4 kilos of sodium bisulfate for 16 litres of water. That gives you the correct ratio of 20%. Now it mixes very easily with water and you do need to use a demineralized water. Don't just use tap water because you can't be sure what's in it. And uh, the only thing is that it's, it is an acid. You do need to pay attention to personal safety when you're doing this. So do wear face shield, safety glasses, wear gloves, make sure you get long sleeves on. And once you mix this, it looks exactly like water. So if you have children at home, you need to make sure that you either lock the anodizing tank away somewhere or lock the lid down on the tank, put a warning label on it. Uh, it is an acid. If you get it on your skin or your eyes, little children are gonna stick their hands in it. It's gonna get serious very quickly. So do use your common sense if you've got this stuff stored anywhere around your house. So that's the electrolyte that I'm using in my tank. Um, I did start with sulfuric acid, but I had a suspicion that it got contaminated in some way because I was having problems with my anodizing. So I ended up swapping it out for this uh, sodium bisulfate. Now, if you do have sulfuric acid and you want to get rid of it, please be aware that you can't just tip it down the sink. You either need to neutralize it or you need to take it to a facility that will do that for you. So some sort of waste disposal facility. But certainly don't just tip it out on the lawn <laughs> or tip it down your sink. That's, uh, that's going to get bad. All right, this is how I got my anodizing bath set up. That's actually under the house. <laughs> um, the reason being that I don't have any more room in my workshop for something like this. And the other thing is that this is going to give off acid fumes and I don't really want this anywhere near my lathe or my milling machine or my, my measuring equipment. So it lives under here, it's, uh, it's totally fine. There's plenty of ventilation under the house here as well so it's probably the best place for it. Now I bought this 20 litre tub down at the local hardware store, it came with the lid and it's just, it's a convenient size, it's made of um, a good high quality plastic and remember I said that if you've got small children you want to be sure that this is locked in some way, so it has a hole in the lid and there's a corresponding slot underneath there, so you can put a padlock or a chain through that and that would secure that. I keep the lid on this all the time just to stop anything dropping in it and contaminating it. And it has an air um, or an aeration system built into the bottom of the tank there, just made from PVC pipe. Now, I rarely use it. I think with the small batches of parts that I do, it's not really necessary. The reason you might want to aerate the tank is to make sure that the small air bubbles come up and knock off any bubbles on the part which can cause spotting. Now like I say I don't normally use it and I haven't noticed any problem with just having the solution uh, unaerated so you, you decide whether you think you need it or not. I've got this sitting on a stainless steel trolley. I've got storage space underneath there where I can put my dyes and other cleaning solutions as well. And this just sort of rolls away when you're not using it. So um, what we do is we put our bus bar on top there and I've got some 3D printed stops there just to stop that round bus bar from rolling away. And then you put your cathodes in there, hook up your power supply and you, you're ready to rock and roll. So let's have a look at that. So there we are with the cathodes in place here and they just sort of drop over the edge of the tank like that. So at the end of the day, just lift them out, rinse them off with water, store them somewhere, put the lid back on and you're ready to put that back into storage. Okay, this is one aspect of this DIY anodizing that gave me the most grief early on and that is being able to hang the parts off the bus bar and ensuring that you're getting a perfect electrical connection. 
Now, like I say, I'm using aluminium wire. A better solution is titanium wire. And I've ordered some, but, you know, <laughs> the way things are going at the moment, it'll be the next century before I get it. Uh, the problem with using the aluminium wire, as I said, is that it gets anodized, and if you don't remove that coating, it's uh, electrically insulated. What I normally do is either just buff the edge of the wire where it makes contact with the part, or clean it in um, sodium hydroxide, which is caustic soda. But either way, you've got to get rid of that old anodized coating if you're reusing the wire. With titanium wire, it's, uh, I, I believe anyway, it's uh, more resistant to uh, the anodizing process and you can reuse the wire fairly easily. And you need to get a little bit inventive about how you're gonna make contact with the part. Now, this one here has a threaded hole in the back, so I've doubled the wire over and I've just simply organized that so that it's a sort of a tight threaded fit into the, the part. So you can see there, I can twist that and remove it. And uh, where is it there? That wire sort of bites in to the threaded hole. So as long as you're getting you know, a solid electrical contact, you should be good. And if, if it's not right, you can just simply spread that wire apart, spread the U-shape of the, the hook apart. But that is not gonna come off there, so I'm happy with that one. With this one here, once again, I'll just spread the end of that wire apart a bit and I'll just poke it down inside there. And I've cleaned that wire and that'll hang and give me a good electrical contact there. Now these are a bit more of a challenge, of course, because they don't have a hole in them. And uh, what I've had to do there is make up this sort of a U-shaped hook arrangement here. I've filed some notches in the legs of the, the U and I've slid that disc through so it sort of sprung between these two points here. And once again, that should give me a good electrical contact. Now I've got to be a little bit careful. Anywhere where the wire touches, it won't form the oxide coating. So I'm a little bit worried about these two points here on the face of this disc. Uh, we may end up with sort of uh, no anodizing right at those two contact points. But that's about the best I can do for now. So we'll see how it goes. This is probably the most tedious part of the anodizing process and that is getting the metal chemically clean. So before this part goes in the anodizing bath, I need to make sure I've got all traces of wax and grease and oil and fingerprints off it. And you can use a variety of cleaners, just a lot of household cleaners will do the job. So anything that's slightly alkaline, got some detergent in it will work. My favorite is just good old Ajax. And if you watch my powder coating video, I use the same product on aluminium parts for powder coating, or any parts for that matter. And it's just very slightly abrasive. I've got a, a little bit of polishing wax on the back of this part here, so I'm just scrubbing that off first. You do need to wear gloves. Your fingers will have an oil film on them and that will contaminate the surface after you've cleaned it. So just wear your gloves, give it a really good scrub, rinse it and then look for any water breaks. Now if the, the water doesn't form beads on the surface, you're good to go. You can buy commercial cleaners for doing this job. I've actually got a tub of it. But if you're looking to do this on a budget, just use Ajax, it works really well. That's pretty much done. The water isn't beading on that surface at all. But you do need to be thorough. It's nothing worse than spending like an hour or two <laughs> on this process and then finding out when you put it in the dye that the little, uh, you know, marks and areas where the dye is not taking up. And you've got to strip it and start all over again. But that's, that's one thing that's good about anodizing. You can actually strip the anodized coating off fairly easily and just go through the process again. Now, I've already done all the other parts, they're all the same. I won't bore you with doing them all. I've seen people using ultrasonic cleaners to do this, but once again, it's a bit of gear that you have to invest in. That's really not necessary. It's just convenient. Okay, that's looking good. All right, one final step you can use before you put your parts in the anodizing bath is to run them through a solution of caustic soda or sodium hydroxide. All this does is just strips off any oxide coating that might have formed while you were waiting to get the parts all clean and assembled on the rack. This step 
is not absolutely essential. I find it's sort of just an insurance policy really. And although that looks a bit grubby, it's fine. So just give them one last rinse in clean water, put it in the caustic soda, and we're looking for maybe 30 seconds, maybe a minute. You should see fine bubbles coming up to the surface there. And the sodium hydroxide will actually attack the aluminium and etch it. So you don't want to leave it in there too long. So it'll come out looking a bit grey and a bit fuzzy. Give it another rinse. I'm just using demineralized water here. And that's ready to load onto your bus bar and ready to go in the anodizing bath. And you want to do this just before you start the anodizing process. So we'll just load this in now and just tighten that screw until it bites down onto the, the hanger wire. That's nice and secure. So that part's ready. We'll get the other three loaded up and let's start cooking. Right, so you can see here I've got all my parts hanging from the bus bar now. I've got my lead cathodes in the tank. So we're all ready to power up and set the voltage and the amperage. So I've got my power supply set up here. We'll just switch on. Uh, first I'll just put my positive on the bus bar. Negative goes on your cathode and switch on your power supply. Now I've got this set to 15 volts so if I turn the volt switch over you'll see that it's showing 15 volts but in reality it drops down lower than that sitting on about 11 at the moment. I've got my amperage set to about half an amp. Now there are various calculators that allow you to work out supposedly exactly the voltage and amperage that you need. However, in practice I found that it doesn't really work. Uh, the problem is that you need to be able to work out the surface area of all your parts. Now some parts are so convoluted and complex that that would be a difficult task. You can model the parts in CAD and actually query the CAD program to tell you what the surface area is. But even when I've done that, I find that uh, the actual amperage being drawn by the parts is nowhere near what the calculator said it should be. So what I tend to do is just set the voltage to 15 volts and then just let the parts draw up to say half an amp depending on how many parts you have in there. And then as far as the time goes I normally leave it for an hour or two. The longer you leave it the thicker the anodized coating will be. But there's really no downside to leaving it longer rather than shorter. And if you're doing everything right you should see fine bubbles coming off your cathodes. Not sure if I've got enough light here to show you. There's some very, very fine bubbles coming off from the cathodes. The actual aluminium parts should be showing some fine bubbles as well, but not as much as the cathodes. Okay, let's let this go now. We'll come back in about an hour and check them. Okay, those parts have been in there now for about an hour and a half. Uh, just from my experience, 40 minutes is about the minimum. But if you want a good thick coating, more than an hour, preferably an hour and a half. And what we do now is just disconnect our power Let's just leave that on. Okay, these come out. And what you want to do now is just give them a rinse. This is just uh, demineralized water, and the idea here is to stop any of that electrolyte getting carried over into the next process, which is dyeing. And, and if you've been successful, what you should notice is that the surface of the part now has a slightly grey-green look to it and it should be slightly dull like a satin finish. If it still looks shiny and like polished aluminium it probably hasn't worked and you need to look at your setup. But I reckon these are good uh, so let's get on to the next step which is the dye. The exciting part. <laughs>
Remember this stuff from when you were a kid? Ah, good memories. Oh, no. Oh, <laughs> bad memories. Oh, man. That is so sweet. How did I ever drink that? <laughs> yeah, get rid of that. Oh, thank goodness for adult beverages. Oh, that's better. Okay, let me clean up this mess. Okay, let's get serious for a minute. No, <laughs> that was just my little joke. Don't go drinking the dye. Now, I have actually got three different colored dyes here. I've got a deep red, electric blue, and a black. The black I'm not so sure about, but we'll give it a go. The red dye is actually heating up at the moment. And I bought one of these little immersion heaters from Caswell. It's got a thermostat that sits uh, inside the liquid to keep it at a constant temperature. So I've got this sitting at about 50 degrees centigrade. The other two are just room temperature. Now it'll work at room temperature as long as you're not in freezing conditions, but the part will take up the dye a lot more quickly if it's warmed up. The, the dyes that I'm using are from Caswell, uh, Caswell Australia. They have an online store. Uh, Caswell is an American company, but I get these here in Australia. They come in these little four ounce bottles. You can also buy it as a powder. This is just to save on shipping costs uh, because you can dilute it when you get it home. Now, some people have had success with this Rit fabric dye. I haven't, I have some, but I haven't actually tried it. Um, I figure if you got the real thing, that's the way to go. Anyway, let's get the parts in here now, see how they go. Now, if the anodizing gods have smiled on you, uh, this should happen almost straight away especially if you're using a heated dye. A lot of what you're seeing there is just the dye on the surface of the part. You really have to rinse that to see how well it's taken up. Wait till I get my water bottle and we'll just give it a rinse. So you can see a lot of that comes off but let's just sit that in there for a few minutes. And you do have to monitor that. Uh, the longer you leave it in the dye, the darker it will get. And if you're trying to color match parts, you really need to sort of have them side by side or do them at the same time. I did have a problem with um, the dial indicator holder for my lathe. I did the parts on two separate days. Didn't get it right. <laughs> and you can tell by looking at it. But that is pretty much done. So you've seen that in real time. I haven't sort of cut the, the video here. Looks good. There's no little bare patches anywhere. All right, I'm guessing that was a total of about three minutes in the dye and I don't want that to go any darker. So I think I'll leave that there. Actually, maybe, no, I'll give it a bit more. These parts going in the blue dye will take a bit longer because this is room temperature. You see that there isn't that immediate change. So I'm just going to let them sit there and we'll just check them periodically but that will take a lot longer. I think our red part's done. I'll just rinse that off again. The colour is a little bit darker than the other parts that I've done but some of the colour will leach out when we do the last step in the process which is the sealing. So I'll leave that there now and uh, we'll do the other ones. So there's the handle in the black. Once again, this is room temperature dye, so it's going to take a while. I think it's starting to colour up. And yeah, starting to go. Once again, could take up to half an hour. Well, there's the, the blue parts that I've done. That's taken a lot longer, <laughs> like an hour and that's the difference between heating the dye or leaving it room temperature. But they're pretty much the colour I want and what we need to do now is rinse these and get them into a container of boiling water. So this is the final step in the process. So they're going to go into a container of boiling water for about 20 minutes and that process seals the pores on the oxidised coating that allows the dye to penetrate. And if we don't do this step the dye will eventually leach out and the colour won't remain consistent. So we do need to do this step. 
but it's pretty straightforward, just 20 minutes. And in the interest of uh, domestic harmony, don't use your wife's best uh, saucepans for this process. I've got an old one down the shed here that I use. So I'll leave those boil away there. And you may notice when you're doing this, a small amount of the color uh, coloring the water itself. Don't be alarmed by that, that's quite normal. And you may also notice that you go a slightly, very slightly lighter shade. I'm just rinsing these off in water just so we don't contaminate the other parts, the different coloured parts. Let's have a look at the black one. Oh well that's it there, it sort of didn't come out jet black, it's more like a, a really dark charcoal grey. Still looks okay though. So, same with that one. Alright, we'll come back in about 20 minutes. Well there's the same parts, they've cooled down now and I've dried them off. This little uh, knob here is for the mitre gauge that goes on my metal cutting bandsaw and originally this was just a wing nut, looked a bit rubbish, so I uh, made a nice little aluminium one. This is the colour I was trying to match, these are the, uh, the tracking adjustments for the back of the saw, so I was trying to get the same colour. This is the, uh, the handle for my jeweler's roll, and like I say it's not really black, but it's a big improvement on what it was, which was just uh, bare aluminium, so I'm happy with that. And these little blue discs here, what are they for? Well, that's coming up in the next episode. So uh, I'm going to ask you to join me for that. We're going to do a bit of uh, laser etching of anodized aluminium and some CNC drag engraving. So that should be really, really cool. And then the final episode, we're going to do some zinc plating because this bit of mild steel here just keeps rusting <laughs> no matter what I do. And uh, I hate that. So we're going to get that all tarted up and make it look lovely. So please uh, join me in the next episode of Metal Finishing with Mark. It's going to be a cracker. And uh, yeah, and oh, kids, don't drink the Kool-Aid. Oh, it's so pretty.